lot to talk about, obviously, and it could go in a million directions. But when I was sitting and listening to the three talks, what I heard, and this is probably also because it's my current obsession in the world, was that what we're really talking about is changing behavior. Right? We're talking about it whether it's school kids, you know, understanding that eating a vegetable is fun. We're talking about it whether it's trying a veggie burger and not thinking it's going to be terrible. Um, or, you know, trying to understand, you know, trying to change behavior on farms and, and make consumers aware. So I guess I just wanted to start with that. I mean, it's the hardest thing to do. We know very well how to tell people what they should do, but we have a very hard time getting them to do it. And I think that's particularly true in America where the emphasis is always on choice. I mean, nobody wants to be told what to do, right? It's our freedom to eat as many Big Macs as we want or whatever it is. So I wonder if each of you might take uh, a turn um, talking about the challenge of that and what successes you have seen, what has worked um, because I think that that's really at the heart of all of the different threads. I'll let anybody go first. I'll go first um, because the, it's absolutely consumer behavior, but really the key is the, I would call it the customer behavior. So getting the meat buyers in these major chains to take a plant-based product and put it in the meat section, or getting a restaurant chain to, to basically um, treat a vegan burger like they would a hamburger. And just in the same way I know, you know, with Greg's work, getting um, a, a chain like Taco Bell to say, we're gonna take a stand on this. So those, of course, they'll only take those stands if they think the consumer is close by. They're really intertwined, but if you only get the consumer, and we've seen it with Beyond Meat, if we only were selling to the vegans, we'd end up still being in that freezer and we just wouldn't be able to reach it. So it really is a, a two, well, it's multi-pronged, but certainly getting the customer is a critical piece of it. But certainly, yeah, getting the consumer is a critical piece of it, but in, they have to, de to some degree, the demand has to be there for the retailer to take you That's seriously. That's right. Th these retailers do take risks. I mean, I, I know it sounds like, oh, McDonald's, you know, taking on his kids once it's become a national brand, but that's a big deal for them. They move from a drink that was 80 calories to 35 calories, so less than half the calories. And, and knowing, you know, they're going to be, and I, I hear about it, there's kids who <laughs> take this product and say, wait, what happened, you know? Um, so that's, a, that's a, you know, someone sort of leaning in in the future. And I, I'm, you know, very glad to see that happen. But it's not a, we shouldn't just take it as, oh, that's, a, that's an easy thing to make happen. It's not. Well, and we also have to give people the opportunity to make that choice. I mean, and I think this dovetails with what you were saying. One of the things in the work that was done with Walmart, and I mentioned the partnership and their pledge to sell things with fewer trans fats, salts, and sugars in their stores and also work with their supplier chain, they had started to hear from and talk to the people who were shopping there who were saying, this is what we want, but we, we can't even get it. We don't have access to it. Um, and arming, giving them the opportunity to go in stores and have access to those kinds of products or, as I said, to walk into pick your chain store when you walk in and knowing, having the information and saying, well, if that's X number of calories or that has X amount of sugar and I want less, not only can I get it, but I have the information that allows me to make that decision. And also, to your point about changing behavior, when you start to have greater access to that, sometimes initially there is pushback. You taste something and it doesn't taste good or right or normal, but that's also because you've had something that has a lot of sugar or a lot of salt in it. And the opportunity to allow your taste buds to change, and in some cases, to formulate those tastes from the very beginning, so you have baby food that has a lot of sugar or a lot of salt or, or other products in it, um, because those palates are being shaped from the beginning, to be able to access that kind of information and those kinds of products gives people the opportunity to change their behaviors and to make those kinds of requests. And I think it depends on the kind of change of behavior that you're talking about. Now, if you're asking kids to do a, you know, a little bit less sugary juice, then maybe Michelle Obama is enough because she'd be enough to make me change juice, right? So <laughs> if, you know, it, that might just be enough to do it, There's that kind of convincing. When you're asking people to fundamentally change the way that they treat and pay farm labor at the base of the entire food system, 
you're asking for a much harder uh, you know, proposition. And so what, you, what you're going to have to do there is exercise power. It, it still comes down to power. And so you know, markets are hierarchical systems of power. You know, this, it just goes from, from the top to the bottom. And each one, each level is a sort of order of magnitude greater than the one beneath. And what most people don't understand is they think that the markets stop at Walmart or McDonald's. And that those are the great powers, those are the great dinosaurs that determine what happens beneath. But in fact, we are the last rung on the power of, the, of markets. We just simply don't tend to organize. We don't tend to, to exercise our power in a concerted fashion. When we do organize, we can make any one of those dinosaurs dance the way we want them to dance. And then when they dance the way we want them to dance, the, those beneath them dance as well. And that's, and that's what it comes down to. But it's a question of us concertedly going about acting together toward a, toward a single goal of changing the behavior of those major buyers, which then translates all the way down to the fields. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, there are 10 questions running through my head right now. But the, you know, one of the things I think, and this is also sort of peculiarly American, is that you know, we want it to be easy, right? Like, I still want to have my iced tea, and I still want to be able to get it everywhere, but I still want it to taste good, and I want it to be better for me, and there should be no friction for me whatsoever. And, you know, that's just not true, really. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of, I mean, maybe you can make the argument, and I'm happy for you to do so, that the Beyond Burger is a no trade-off burger, you know, and that there are examples of that in food. But I think one of the things is sort of acknowledging is what you're saying, which is that there are trade-offs and that it's important. And, and I, I feel like that's a message that's very hard for, that people don't want to hear. And I guess I just wonder, you know, what do you do about that? I mean, if the prevailing philosophy is choice, freedom, you can do whatever you want, you know, we'll offer you the lower sugar, but it's really up to you. I mean, there's no... But the changes can be profound. I'll just go take the example of, of the kids' drink. When we brought Honest Kids out, which was about 10 years ago, every kid's drink pouch was 100 calories per pouch. Mm -hmm. It really was. And, and, um, and I was embarrassed because I was actually buying those for my kid. But that's how I got the idea. My son said, well, how come you're selling healthy drinks to grown-ups, but you're giving me these really sugary drinks? <laughs> and we went out at 40 calories. If you look today and you walk a shelf, the average is probably closer to 60. And so that's a really profound change. There has been, um, basically, parents had said, we don't need to give our kids drinks that sweet. And the kids, you know, I, they I kind of say they don't have a choice. They basically, if it's in the lunchbox, that, that they're going to drink what's there. Right. And when we formulated, we basically found 40 calories was sweet enough the kid would drink it, right. may not be excited, but they could change their behavior. So there are cases where um, when you create sort of the, the consideration set, and, uh, it can move. And, and that's been a big change in, in terms of the palate for young people. Right. I kind of hate to be the, <laughs> the turd in the punch bowl, as a friend of mine says. Um, <laughs> but, um, well, that's where I was going with this. Yeah, I know. You make me the turd in the punch bowl. Cool. <laughs> I set you up. Um, right? Here's an example, and it's not, not quite as easy. Um, so we have a program. It's the only proven program to stop sexual assault, sexual harassment, and slavery in U.S. agriculture. It's proven. It's, I mean, it's received presidential medals. President, President Obama gave a medal for its ability to fight um, slavery. You know, it's, it's just been recognized by anybody who pays attention to these things as being the most effective program. Every single fast food company except one is on board. That one, a couple years ago, Wendy's, left Florida, <laughs> Wendy's, Spelled so W-E-N-D-Y apostrophe S. Um, <laughs> left Florida in order to get away from the program and shifted its purchases to Mexico. Where if anybody knows anything about Mexico, it's basically a failed civil society where gender-based violence is off the charts. Women have no recourse to, to justice. And the silence you hear out of there is not the absence of sexual assault or sexual sexual harassment, it's that nobody complains about it because if they did, the results would be worse than the crime itself. So here's a company that has gone out of its way to not do what all of its competitors are doing already and to, and to go to this other place where people are actually actively being hurt to pick the stuff that they sell to the public. Now what thinking is going on there if, all, if every reasonable argument 
for what should be done business-wise, even just pure business in the 21st century. People know that they, they expect, in the 21st century, business books are written about the fact that consumers expect companies to have a social purpose and to have a business model that's consistent with that social purpose. And yet this is the exact opposite of that. So how do you explain that? And it comes down and sometimes to greed, it comes down and sometimes to ego, it comes down to things, but when it, the heavier the lift, the more those sort of extraneous, insane reasons come up instead of just plain straight, makes a lot of sense to go to less sugar. You know, kind of just to wrap that up, I mean, we could talk about that for the rest of our time, but would they, do you have an explanation for why they didn't, and does the CIW have an ongoing boycott of Wendy's because of that? <laughs> the CIW has an ongoing boycott of Wendy's because of that, um, all of which you, all of whom, are invited to join. Um, <clears throat> it, you know, look. My job we is just work. to set him up <laughs> yeah, here, that's what like, I do. Like a, like a straight person. Yeah. Um, no, but look, we've only done two boycotts in the 15 years of this, of this program. And, and we don't, and frankly, look, I have a 13-year-old son, beautiful wife. I would prefer to be at home most of the time, hanging out, playing basketball with my son, chilling with my family. Instead, we have to be protesting and boycotting and doing things that make no sense at this point, when you have a proven program that can stop one of the things that is top of mind in this country today, which is sexual abuse at work, right? Not only is it a question of something that helps farm workers, but here we have the Me Too and the Time's Up movement, right, yeah, searching for this solution. And we have a solution, searching for awareness, right? And so we, this, it's a perfect moment. And yet, you know, there are forces that are acting against the, the, the its expansion. And the, the, the good thing is that we are greater than those forces, and we've seen it over and over again. Again, it's the question of if consumers act in a concerted way, we can beat those. Well, I wanted to pose that question. You, you, you set me up that time perfectly, <laughs> um, which was you know, really about sort of the rising activism that we have seen in this country with Me Too, with a number of other movements. I mean, this is raising awareness, but it's also, I think, made clear to a lot of people that they have to get off the sidelines. And so I'm curious, you know, have any of, any of you seen that movement sort of come to food and to issues in food, whether they are labor or health? Um, because the flip side of that, of course, could be, oh my God, there's so many things to worry about, you know, nuclear war, you know, maybe I don't need to get out there and start protesting about food. So how has it played out and how is that affecting what you're seeing coming? Yeah. I've seen some of that take place in a very segmented way. But I think that's part of the problem and part of the larger problem that uh, particularly seeing younger people who are focused on you know, the treatment of workers, treatment of animals. You see people who are concerned about what's in their food, um, where does it come from? You see a localism. You, I mean, you see all of these segmented movements. But I think one of the problems that we have is that most people, certainly most Americans, don't understand their complete food chain and the ripple effect and the connective tissue that binds one to the other, um, and what it means if you're going to start to flip levers and push buttons on those different parts of the chain, going to your earlier point, what it ultimately will mean to me in addition to how I can be helpful to affect issues of labor, um, to how I can deal and, and be supportive of local farmers, how I can have an effect on larger companies, what will come and what will ultimately be on my plate, what I'll be able to buy in stores, and the list goes on and on. And there are any number of things that have to happen there, but there are such significant cultural forces pushing against it, and quite frankly, wanting people to remain ignorant and people remaining uninformed about what the complete food chain looks like that I, I think we haven't seen all those pieces strung together in a way that can be as powerful as I hope it would ultimately be. I think there's never been a more hopeful, um, positive moment in food, at least in my lifetime. And we see absolutely, you know, consumers may feel unempowered politically, but three times a day, or at least three times a day, people have the opportunity to vote with their mouths and then with their stomachs. And so, you know, at, at Beyond Meat, we've, we, last year we had over four billion media impressions, which is kind of insane. Like, I, I mean, honesty has been around a long time, and we have never seen anything like that. But consumers get excited and empowered about their choices, and they love to share and talk about it. We, we launched with a national restaurant chain at Beyond Meat. Um, over the past 90 days, they had 900 million media impressions. 500 million of those were about the Beyond Burger. So just um, in, when you sort of find the right chord with a passionate consumer, 
they literally can change what happens uh, in food. Yeah, and I, w I would take it beyond food, and, and, and I think where your question might have been coming from further is we are in a very strange time in the country. Um, you know, it's never been like this since maybe 1968, where everything was sort of up in the air. And, and we have a president who has made it clear that um, the traditional sort of venues for political change are closed, um, a president and a Congress. And so you have things like the Women's March, probably the biggest single march in the history of the United States. Then you had the March for Our Lives, which may have been as big or bigger than that. Then you have right now something that's very interesting that's kind of a little bit under the radar, but and some of my, my family here are teachers here in the Charlottesville schools, but the teachers are probably, it's probably the biggest single mobilization of teachers across the country in the history, at least of the past you know, 100 years. Um, and all of these are because people feel that they have no other option. People who would not normally protest feel they have no other option but to go out in the street and do these very beautiful, very, very... Um, joyous, kind of uplifting actions, but very powerful actions at the same time. And it can't help but feed over, you know, into food. You know, when, when Wendy's attacked us, <laughs> this is so absurd, I'm laughing before saying it, that when Wendy's attacked the, the, the farm worker women of the CIW of exploiting the beautiful Time's Up movement for their own purposes by saying that it's Time's Up, you know, Wendy's, because you're not, you're not taking responsibility for sexual harassment in your supply chain. All the leaders of Time's Up stood up and, and came straight to the defense of the farm workers and said, Wendy's, you don't get it. These women are Time's Up. These farm workers have been fighting for these things way before we even defined Time's Up. They are our movement, right? So there is the opportunity for, 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 that, for that overlapping and coming together, and the more the more these essential issues don't get fixed or addressed, the stronger the movement to force a solution will come. You know, it's interesting because what I hear is, is optimism, um, you know, both on the private sector side and on sort of the more public, pol well, I mean, it's still private sector, but sort of public activism role. But I think you're right, Melody, that, you know, it's hard for people to sort of, the, the food chain is so complex and when you, you know, it's like a, air balloon, you know, a balloon, you push on one side and the other side pops up and you don't quite understand that. So, you know, I guess you've identified a good problem, which is how do you help people see the whole picture and, and, and act in a way so that they're affecting the food system the way they want to? How do we do that? And, you know, more specifically, is Michelle Obama coming back to do that for us? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> you heard it here for, that's the news, everybody. Everybody, everybody can go now. But, right. No, it, it, yes and no. No, the Obamas and, you know, there may be people in the audience who think this There's is a good thing. somebody leaving right now, but for, right, for those of you who God, wanted the Obamas right. back, um, not in the White House, <laughs> neither one of them, um, though she will remain engaged in this fight. This is something that she's very passionate about. Some of you may have heard her speak about this. Uh, since she's left the White House, she remains... Uh, honorary chairperson of the Partnership for a Healthier America, and I imagine in the months to come, um, after her book comes out and some other things, that she will find other ways to remain engaged in this fight. But I think the important thing, and this goes back to the issue of organizing, and it's one of the things that we were hoping to accomplish through Let's Move, and while there was Let's Move Indian Country, there was Let's Move Childcare, and Let's Move Cities and Towns, and Let's Move Houses of Worship, the point of that was to drive this into communities, uh, to set a goal that was an important national goal with regard to childhood obesity, but to engage in communities and have local organizations educate themselves and to find ways that they could increase activity and information in those communities and engage with one another on these issues, because that's the only way that this is, uh, this popped in my head, I have to say it, this is going to take root. Um, and so it is that kind of knowledge that happens and people are, are sharing it, and it is that kind of organizing um, that people will have to do to transform our food system. Organizing isn't just, it, it happens in response to things that are challenging, but it is as part, it is as much a part of our country as 
Absolutely. Mom and <laughs> apple healthy pie. apple pie. Apple pie, another <laughs> I good thing. I was looking for yeah. an alternative, apple pie. Yeah. It is as natural to us. It is because change is in our hands. I mean, this is what Barack Obama talked about in 07 and 08, and others have talked about through millennia. Transformation belongs to us, particularly in a constitutional republic. So what we see, what we get, is what we deserve if we aren't stepping up, <laughs> I'm sorry, to the plate to make these changes. I can't stop, I'm gonna stop because I keep going. But you get my point. <laughs> And just to add, I mean, definitely in a, in a republic, but also in a free market economy where consumers have empowered, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I mean, it, it's, oh, go ahead. No, it's, it, is, it is both those things, right? It's, you know, every change we've made, we've made through the market. But we've made it using the market by mobilizing the market through protest. Right? And, and so it's, yeah. it, you have to you organize have to, have to actually then make the market do what it should, because the market itself is not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily produce evil outcomes. It just tends to. But, right? but, but, <laughs> but, but, but it doesn't have to. But it doesn't yeah. have to. It can produce actually you know, less inequality. It can produce greater justice. And it is in our case. You saw the case of Alejandrina. I mean, she came to the United States 14, 20 years ago and was immediately assaulted. Today, she's not. And that's because of the marketplace. And when it sticks in the marketplace, it, it, it's much harder to have it undone by policy. So right. you mentioned that things can be undone. But for example, organics has grown dramatically. And, um, you know, there were some attempts recently to water down organic standards that could have hurt um, the growth. But in general, you know, that movement towards lower calorie kids drinks, I don't, whether it's a change of administration, I don't see that going back. I don't see, or, or I don't see people saying I want less transparency or I want, you know, less healthy products. Well, I think that that's, you know, that's a perfect segue because, you know, the private sector, you know, sort of the role of the private sector and how we can affect it. I mean, I just saw a statistic um, that said, I think it was 35% millennials, 35% of millennials believe that their purchases have more effects than their vote. Um, and it was the largest, you know, the, the largest group and it went down from there. But I mean, it was still in the 20s for, you know, Gen Xers and boomers, you know, so people definitely feel that they can make that change. And it's interesting, I wanted to go back to when you had talked about how, you know, Michelle, I just, we're on like a first name basis, you know, in my head. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, when she made that, I remember I was at the Gr Grocery Manufacturers Association meeting and she came to speak and she made this big announcement that they were gonna be working with Walmart. And it was interesting because the sort of super left wing, you know, good food, Alice Waters type press was horrified. And there were all these, you know, blog posts and articles about how, you know, the White House was obviously selling out and how ridiculous it was. And, and I remember thinking, well, gee, if, you know, Walmart can take 25% of the sugar out of something that someone's buying anyway, and all they have to do is keep going and buying it, and it's no friction for them, that, you know, that sounds pretty good. But it's interesting, that's all a long way of saying the role of the private sector today in particular, I mean, I would say that however many years ago that was, we all had sort of a different vision of the impact that our federal government was going to have on these particular issues. Is it all in the private sector's court right now? Is it hopeless to be working on this at a policy level? Um, you know, and, and, and I mean, I, I mean that for this group, you know, where should they be putting their energies? I can, I can. You, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mean. So I, I work in the, I know Virginia is the South, but I live, I live in Florida. And, um, and the, the, the legislature in Florida is, you know, 75% certified. And, and so there's no, there's, no, there's no chance of us doing anything there, right? Anything pro-labor, anything pro-human rights there. Um, and then you get to, you know, the next level, the federal level, and playing field is still just equally 90 degrees tilted against us, right? So we, we eventually came up with the whole approach that we came up with precisely because we had no access. We were essentially stateless people down there where we are. And, and so we had no access, no option to do that. And in fact, what we ended up finding out was not only is it faster through the market to create some real measurable, serious, important, unprecedented change, but what happens is that change washes over into the, into the government in many, in many cases and creates new policy. When we first discovered forced labor in Florida in the early 1990s, there was no trafficking unit in the Department of Justice or, the, or FBI. Now there is. 
They didn't know what to do with the information we gave them at first, now they do. Their approach to, to investigating those cases, a worker-driven, worker-led approach, came from our approach. So we've been able to, to create policy, but not through the usual sort of attempts at buying or accessing it through the, <laughs> you know, bribery, uh, but through actually just creating a system that works. So there is, there is a lot that can be done, I, and, and I want people to understand that, that it is a really frustrating time to be somebody who wants to see positive social change happen in this country. But there's a lot that can be done if you just, if you prove it on the street. It's a both and D, all of the above. Um, and I agree with, I absolutely agree with you about the role, the, the critical role that the private sector plays. Uh, we aren't going to and nor do I want to live in a society where there is no pri where there is no private sector. There are important market makers and market changers, and they do it not only when it happens here; it can also happen globally. Um, so that they were important partners, and from the beginning of our work in the White House, we knew that they were going to be critical partners for us. And also, I think one of the things we wanted to convey convey was that we weren't living in some kind of I was going to say utopian, but I wouldn't even consider it utopian because you know, cherry cobbler is one of my favorite food groups. Um, but we didn't want to convey that people were just going to live their lives in, in this very, you know, stilted, narrow way. Um, and that's why you also saw Michelle Obama at Shake Shack from time. You know, it's, we wanted to convey that message and have the private sector as, as partners. At the same time, policy making allows you could, to do things, particularly on the federal level, at scale. Um, if you can. Sometimes what you're doing is you're simply setting a floor for others to try and, and uh, rise above, but it allows you to do things on a macro level. So when you look at something like school lunches and school breakfasts and after school snacks and you know, greater access to those kinds of meals, you're talking about a ripple effect across millions and millions of children. Um, so that becomes important too. One of the things I will never forget, Senator Kennedy used to often say to me when I worked for him, is that you know, there's this moment and you have to be ready for it and the door can be locked and the window can look closed, but all of a sudden you'll see the window crack and you've got to be ready to go through it. So the work that we do with the private sector, the work that may happen the local level in some places or the state level prepares us to be able to take advantage of those moments when they are available to us. And, and I want to ask a question to Seth because I think that the private sector and the food industry is very primed for this. I mean, yeah. clean food, good food, they're all jumping on the bandwagon. You see all these interesting things happening at Campbell's and, and all kinds of places. I guess the, my question for you is, is, as someone on the inside, how real is that? Are they just saying this to make us, you know, go back to sleep? And, you know, what is the best way for this audience and this group to communicate with companies about what they want? It's, it's real. I mean, these companies, any, any, every big, every major food company got the memo that consumers have changed and, and they see it in declining sales. And so there's literally, I think the study was, over the past five years, something like $27 billion has moved away from, you know, big food toward smaller, uh, you know, more entrepreneurial or cleaner food. And so, um, you know, when we look at Honest Tea, uh, I guess Coca-Cola invested about 10 years ago into Honest Tea. We're now 10 times larger as a company than we were. And now, basically, they see the increment, incrementality of those sales. So that's, that's real. And, and that's obviously what they hope would happen. And, and frankly, it's what I hope would happen when they invested, that we could get this idea to scale. So um, the way that consumers can impact it is by seeking out those healthier choices, whether it's organic, fair trade. Uh, or lower calorie, you know, whether they, th they think is healthier. And that's, that's a, that, ideally, that's what a consumer would be doing anyway. It's just that the choices are more available now. And, and, and when they're not available, consumers should absolutely make the request of the restaurant or retailer to have those things. Um, and especially because these smaller companies don't have the reach of, um, you know, the big companies. So, you know, in, in effect, our consumers can become our, our uh, sort of delegated sales force to help create that demand. The, 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 I think we all agree right, that, that consumers are the driving force, have to be the driving force for, for the market to actually respond in the way that it should, in a healthy way, in a, in a just way, whatever it might be. Uh, the problem is that, that the forces that want to sell sugary stuff or want to sell unjust stuff have billions of dollars in advertising. And yep. we have a couple of sticks. And, you know, <laughs> but that's and, where social media can be so powerful. Yes. 
Yeah. Is there really anybody at the end of that Twitter account? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, who's there? <laughs> exactly. Bots. You know, it just doesn't, it doesn't come to the same thing. It doesn't, it doesn't add up. You know, the, I'm the waiting for social is, media to go away. Yeah, <laughs> social media is a, is a thing. You know, yeah. we, can, we, can, we can use it, but it doesn't, it's a flash in the pan even when it's great. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't add up to that consistent ad buy that they just continually feed into our brains. Which is why we got, you know, beaten about the head and shoulders when we were working on food marketing to kids. Um, during the Obama administration. Right. Uh, it, I mean, talk about a bloody battle. And you had the right. bully pulpit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right. You, you know, you had to beat us over the heads with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I mean, the news is, the, you know, the, the news coming out of the ag department now is not good. That's marketing to kids isn't going to happen. You know, they merged the Center for Nutrition and Policy Promotion with FNS, and so, you know, you don't, the people who are running the dietary guidelines are now not in, you know, independent. So there's a lot that's happening on that level. I mean, we have a couple minutes left, then I'm going to go to questions. I didn't ask you to prepare for this, but I'm nevertheless going to put you on the spot and say, you know, what I would like from each of you before we go to questions is one, three, five, whatever you like, things that people who care about food with and a just healthy food system, what should they do? What should they go out and do? And it can't be by honesty. <laughs> Beyond meat? <laughs> uh, uh, well, one, I think we have to arm ourselves with information. We have to educate ourselves. But two, and this goes to the, the issue of protest, you know, you are, you are, it, you can call it protest or you are voting when you buy things the way that you engage with the person that you vote for to represent you, understand where they stand on these issues, um, so that you are both impacting the private sector side and that you are impacting um, the public sector side. And what you do as an individual makes, makes a difference. People count those calls, they count those emails, they count the, you know, they see what's happening on Twitter, and heaven knows they pay attention to what's happening inside those markets. We talked to and heard from CEOs and others who said, we are absolutely paying attention to what people want. And part of educating yourself is also understanding the full food chain. It starts with farmers and goes all the way, all the way up at every step of the way. And also understand and be willing to pay for what real food actually costs. Let me just add before we go to Seth, for anybody who's interested in seeing where their legislators stand on food issues, the Environmental Working Group has a food scorecard where you can go and look up your representative and see how they voted and see how they're rated on these food issues. So if that's something you want to do, you can find that on their website. So I would say um, whenever you have the chance to buy organic and fair trade, you should. Uh, and if you don't have that option, you should request of the retailer or restaurant that you'd like to have it. And the reason I emphasize those is because those are third-party verified seals. I don't trust a company that says we're you know, environmentally friendly or we're socially responsible. It's really having a third-party verify that either the agricultural conditions or the labor conditions are met by you know, objective standards. And then the, the other piece I would say is every family should try to have at least one more plant-based meal per week. And that's, that's actually a very light lift, but the environmental and health impacts of that will be profound. Uh, one of the things I didn't get to say earlier was that um, the Fair Food Program is not a one-off thing. Right? It gave birth to, it was the sort of proof of concept of an approach that's now called the worker-driven social responsibility um, paradigm for protecting, for protecting workers' rights in in corporate supply chains around the globe. And so, for example, it's already expanded to Vermont in the dairy industry with Ben & Jerry's and a worker group there. And more importantly, it's expanded to the apparel industry in Bangladesh, where 1.5 million workers now can go to, to work in these factories that used to collapse, burn to the ground on a regular basis, and kill thousands of workers. And now they have the ability to, to if they see a crack in the wall, not go to work, report the crack, keep their jobs, get the crack fixed, and then go to work without having to worry about never seeing their children again just because they needed to go to work. So the worker-driven social responsibility model is something that has essentially an unlimited possibility or a potential for changing millions of the poorest workers' lives in this country and in the globe. And so learn more about that model. There's a worker-driven social responsibility network website. There's also the Fair Food Program Dot org website, learn, education, 
learn about the things that are out there that can help change people's lives because we now have a proven cure to some of the cancers that we have not been able to deal with in the past. And why not spread those cures? Okay, well, I am going to open it up to questions if anybody has one. I think, I, are you gonna, are, I think that you can come down to this mic. I, I don't know if they're running around with them or not. So we've got one here, and then we'll go nice. over here next. And I ask you, because we only have 10 minutes, if um, you know, we can keep the questions short and questions, not comments. Um, I have a member in my household who's from Germany, and in Germany, when they put out their trash, they have trash, and they have recycling, and they have compost. Um, that community is a sixteenth of the size of Charlottesville. Um, so I was wondering if you all have any observations on um, kind of phase two of the future of food, which is the future of food waste, and um, where we're headed with that. Your food waste guy. I mean, it's a great question, and the issues of food waste are critical, um, starting with uh, what happens on farms, and you know, farmers are making moves to try and use what's left behind on the ground for them to help to feed uh, those who are less well off to the kind of food waste that you're talking about, and certainly composting. I don't, I, my husband, I think, is somewhere in here. I married a man who is obsessed with composting. Um, <laughs> and That's what is, you should do. <laughs> obsessed with it. Um, but it is absolutely something that we've seen in different communities, and I've seen them in some communities, uh, U.S. communities, something that we could talk to and engage with our public officials about in more communities so that we could um, we can add it to our recycling paradigm as well. Hi, um, thank you for a great discussion. Um, Greg, um, I like you, you're really cool. Um, my question is for you, because you are not a minority, you're not a female, you're not you know, an immigrant for as far as I know, you That's don't really, um, in the category of social justice that you're kind of pursuing. Um, so, Thinking beyond food, how do we engage or persuade or influence people who that is not their background um, to think about issues beyond what's in their own community or in their own backyard? Like, what was your passion? What, cat, what, what motivated you to take on this cause? Because it clearly is not a reflection of who you are and the environment that you're in. Yeah. Well, it's a very long story, um, most of which won't even bother you with, but I am actually the son of immigrants. But, but beyond that, um, the, you know that story I told in the beginning about the, the farm stand and seeing somebody? At some point in my life, about my wife and I both basically looked behind that farm stand and saw that happen. And that kind of locked us into the, into the world of wanting to do something about it and being able to do something about it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, 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 the proximal reason why. The other reason why is, you know, they're called universal human rights for a reason. And if I had a Bible, it would be the universal human rights, the declaration of, the UN Declaration of Human Rights. That would be the Bible by which I live my life. And, it's, and it applies to everybody, to, to, to me, to you, to anybody that is human. And so for me, that's, that's what directs my, my thinking, the, the way I am in the world. So I don't know if that answers your question, but the thing is, that is, that is it for me. Thank you. Go over here. Uh, Seth, with honesty and now Beyond Meat even being more revolutionary, what is the ultimate goal you're working towards? Like it may be in the agriculture industry or nutrition, like what's pulling you? Um, well, I think, you know, I really look at it through those two companies. So with Honest Tea, it is to see us, you know, in organics more generally to be at least 10% of the American diet. Um, that's, uh, it's about 3% now, depending on how you count it. But I think that's absolutely achievable. And then to expand into Europe and around the world. With Beyond Meat, um, I'd say the first step is to get every American to have that one more plant-based meal. And we think it's much easier to do when the product can deliver like that. And that... Um, that is, if, if that happens, it's profound in terms of environmental impact, not to mention um, the, the billions of animals. And once again, to bring that globally as well. So to take these ideas and democratize them, um, I think, and, and when these succeed, and, and we've already seen it with Honesty, when those succeed, other big companies recognize, all right, this is, and then what happens is when those succeed, other investors say, wait a minute, you can put your mission first 
and, and recognize there's a consumer need and then money comes that way and then other entrepreneurs say, oh, you know what, I don't have to go um, do fit into a cog, I can actually do something I believe in. So it really is trying to, to think about the ripples that come from those. Um, so, going actually off of that a little bit more at the agriculture um, side of things, uh, I think that most people agree that buying local, locally produced vegetables is the most uh, socially and uh, environmentally sustainable uh, way of procuring that produce. Uh, however, that's not realistic for everybody. Charlottesville, we're very lucky that we have that, but um, is that something that you see going to scale more, or are there thoughts that you have on how to make that more to scale? I'll just share one thought. I mean, I think certain categories do make sense to think about buying local, but tea is a great example. That there's no, there's no real tea grown in the United States, or no, no organic tea grown in the United States. So I think you really have to look at certain, and, and for that matter, you know, certain categories I know it sounds crazy to think we'd be shipping things from California, but environmentally, actually, it might mean fewer, um, you know, pesticides and fertil chemical fertilizers used to grow it in California and ship it across the country. So, um, it, it sometimes it, local isn't all that it's uh, cracked up to be. Yeah, local, local can definitely be, um, you know, it's not a very well policed right. category. You know, I can give you a hilarious story about one time, real briefly, we were in Gainesville, Florida, and we were working in watermelons. And the local OSHA inspector came to the field where we were working. He didn't do his OSHA inspection. Instead, he took a bunch of melons for free from the grower that we had picked. We never got paid for. And then we were at the farmer's market that next day outside of Gainesville. And there he was selling organic, which were not organic, watermelons, which were ones we picked that he took from our field that we didn't get paid for. Um, so that was like local organic bullshit melons. <laughs> so that was just one example. It probably didn't, you know, define the whole category. But the problem is, um, you know, you, you can be local, you can be organic, and you can still have sexual assault, sexual harassment, even slavery. You know, be, two of the farms that failed our program are two of the biggest organic and local farms in, in the U.S. So there is no halo of virtue that is real and impenetrable around, around local or organic. And I would just add to that, I mean, and I want to get to the other questions, but, you know, local is complicated, and the, sort of what Melody was speaking to, it's like, how do you understand and take, make all of these judgments? You know, I'm just trying to buy a watermelon. You know, I can't figure this all out right now. And it, it isn't totally obvious, but I do think that one of the things that's very important is, um, you know, people are trying to move from local to regional, and that, you know, it doesn't matter if the tomato was grown, you know, in Virginia or, you know, just that it may be more efficient for trucking, for gas, you know, for all kinds of reasons that it comes from <coughs> just over the line in Tennessee. Um, and that the, the thing that's very important is that there are people working to put those regional systems together that bring the small farmers together and basically make a virtue of small you know, making small big, so you get the benefits of small and the benefits of big. You know, all small is not good, all big is not bad, and it's kind of trying exactly. to make, create exactly. that middle ground. So those local food hubs are the kinds of places you should look to and see if you can support them. Can I just add, it's also important that we, there are other technologies, like aquaponic, hydroponic. I mean, there are other ways that we can think about growing food in different places, there's, and there's a lot of really interesting work that's underway um, in those categories as well. <coughs> Hi. Uh, thanks so much for canceling Wendy's. That was really eye-opening. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for spilling the tea, pun intended. Um, I was just wondering um, what possibilities do you see to go farther than just nutrition and implement vegan slash vegetarian options um, into school lunches and stuff like that and kind of provide um, dietary diversity to students in their schools since we spend so much time there. Are you talking about public schools? Yeah, like pub yep. yeah, public. Yeah, um, um, so we actually, Beyond Meat does currently sell to several school districts, um, but our, absolutely part of the goal is, as I said, to democratize these things. So part of that comes with scale when we can bring the cost down, but part of that also comes with certain school districts being willing to be out in front. and. And then, you know, then it is a marketing thing. Like, can we make something that tastes as good? Um, you know, we, the con 
the students don't have to purchase this, but can we make it taste as good? And can they create the, the right recipes? But it's happening for sure. Um, and um, we've got a lot of school systems that are trying like a meatless Monday or, or, or something like that. And we just want to get in the consideration set. And wouldn't you love to have fair food at your school too? Yes. I'm very serious. You can do that. You can demand that. You know, and, and procurement through either local school districts or from city governments or from the federal government, you know, can really make a difference. But just, you know, because that helps support the right growers who are doing the right thing. Students, once again, they're the, uh, they're the consumer here, they're the customer, so they can make a huge impact. We've seen it in, uh, in Montgomery County where I live. Um, there was a huge effort by the students to move away from polystyrene trays, and then the county finally did move, so. Students are this right now. Talk about protests and, and organizing and movement. <laughs> Talk building. about yeah. the future, man. All right, we are technically out of time. I don't know if I'm allowed to let one more question go. I'm going to just use my decision and let one more question go, and then we will wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to expand on the last question you posed about um, what ways we can, as an individual consumer, cause more effect. Um, and personally, I found that a lot of people in my life who I respect and try to be environmentally or socially conscious, just are flat out ignorant. They don't know what they don't know, for example. So like Maya Joan, she tries to be environmentally conscious, but she's buying a lot of products with palm oil in it, and she has no idea the environmental and health effects that that has in a lot of foreign countries. So it's like, how do you, um, can you give advice on how to spread, like word of mouth is a very powerful tool, how do you cause that effect without telling someone what they don't necessarily want to hear and telling them like, hey, you're wrong. You don't even know you're wrong, but here's some advice that you didn't ask for. Yeah. <laughs> here's some advice you didn't ask for. Yeah. The advice everybody wants to get. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the end, it's, it's the internet. I mean, really, that's the, that's the, we have one, there's, the internet giveth and it taketh away. It kind of sucks right now, but there's a lot of still goodness to it. And the goodness is that you can find out information on pretty much any product you want. Palm oil, Google it. You'll find out everything wrong from slavery to you know, environmental impacts. You know, and, and you can just share that and just insist. And within five, 10 minutes, have more information at your fingertips than somebody could have had taking a week to study it just a few years ago. The other thing I just suggest is that um, there are forms, different M Entertainment um, has, can deliver pa uh, information very powerfully. We, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to have seen this Netflix movie, What the Health? and change their diet as a result. And I'm just, I was really just blown away by that. So when, it can, when a message can be entertaining, um, that can really change behavior. Yeah, and I think it's really also a question of tone. I mean, I've done a lot of research myself into this question of the message versus the messenger, right? Nobody wants to be lectured to. I know this because I'm a food writer. Every time I go to my mom's house, I can see the terror in her eyes. You know, she's like, you're gonna tell me I did the wrong thing. I'm not gonna tell you I did the wrong thing, you know. And yes, every meal counts, but sometimes it's only dinner and you have to give those people a pass and bring them along gently, I think is important. So anyway, thank you to everybody who came to the panel and is still here. We very much enjoyed our conversation and having you with us. Enjoy the rest of the festival.